Thank you, guys. Well, uh, Merry Christmas. It is uh, good to see so many out on what I'm sure is a uh, busy weekend and to see so many last night and then back again today. Uh, we really appreciate you. You being here as we pause just for a few minutes to celebrate the good news of Christmas in a world that often feels like it's drowning in bad news. And I don't know how you feel, but have you ever like just watched the news for a moment and thought, man, it's just more and more and more bad news. Uh, I checked the headlines this morning on the election of Herald Leader earlier today, and unsurprisingly, uh, almost every headline was negative, and, and I'm not going to read them to you because I don't want to ruin the mood, but, but you can predict what they are. Uh, because I'm a nerd, one of the things I pay attention to every year are the words or the phrases uh, that are added to the dictionary, and at the end of last year, there was a word that was added to Webster's Dictionary that you may not be familiar with, uh, but I bet you've done it, even if you didn't know what to call it, and it's the word doom scrolling. Some of you know what that is. Uh, one dictionary, we're going to put it on the, the screen just so you know how to spell it in case you want to use it in a sentence, but one dictionary defines doom scrolling as the act of spending an excessive amount of time reading large quantities of negative news online. Another pushes it a little further and describes it as the practice of obsessively checking online news for updates, especially on social media feeds with the expectation that the news will be bad such that the feeling of dread from this negative expectation fuels the compulsion to continue looking for updates in a self-perpetuating cycle. You know, some of you have done that. I know that I've done that. And if you're a person who does this, then you know there's never a shortage of bad news. Uh, one researcher last year compiled all of the headlines from the major news websites and did an extensive survey of all the cable news channels. And what they discovered is that 93% of all stories that are reported on the news or in the newspaper uh, which could be classified as bad news. And what that means is that over decades of intense research, news producers have learned that as human beings, most of us have developed a negativity bias that is so strong that we are drawn to bad news like a moth is drawn to a flame. It's almost as if we, we can't help ourselves. We get on the website and we click one article and there's a link to another article and we just keep going through drowning ourselves in negativity. And then if that wasn't bad enough, some of us have set it up on our smartphones and our smart watches where if anything goes wrong anywhere in the world, we will immediately be notified by a breaking news alert direct to our phone or our watch. Some of us, before we get out of bed in the morning, are scouring the headlines before we go to sleep at night. We take one last look to see if anything has gone wrong anywhere in the world. And in the process of all of that, what inevitably happens is that as we continually swim in this ocean of negativity, the anxiety, the frustration, the uncertainty, and even fear begin to fill our hearts. And then you come to a day like today, and we talk about the the good news of Christmas, and you can feel the tension, you can feel the, the tension that takes place in this epic collision between the hope that Christmas brings and the fear that surrounds us. Back in 1865, just a few months after the conclusion of the Civil War, there was a, a rather famous Episcopal priest from Philadelphia named Phillips Brooks who traveled to the Middle East uh, for an extended tour of the Holy Land. And as he, as he toured the Holy Land, you've got to remember, it was just after the Civil War, so much of the nation was in the beginning stages of trying to rebuild while almost every family was grieving the loss of someone they loved who had died during the conflict. But as a part of his tour, Phillips Brooks found himself in the city of Bethlehem on Christmas Eve night. And it was such a powerful moment for him that he never forgot what it was like to ride on horseback the six miles from Jerusalem into Bethlehem on that Christmas Eve night under the same open sky that the events which you read about in the New Testament had taken place all those years earlier. 
In fact, it was such a powerful night for him that three years later, in 1868, he recaptured the memory of that night, and he wrote out the lyrics to a song that, that he wanted the kids who were part of his church's Sunday school program to learn, and that the title of the song is, O Little Town of Bethlehem. We're going to sing it in a few minutes, but I want you to listen to the opening words. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in thy dark streets shineth the everlasting light. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. If you have a Bible with you, I want you to turn to Luke chapter 2. This morning we're going to look at just a, a brief part of the Christmas story in which we see this collision between hope and fear that took place at the very first Christmas. It's interesting, when you read through the four Gospels, most of what they say about Christmas is focused on what happens before the, for, before the actual birth of Jesus. But in Luke chapter 2, there's one small section that focuses on something that took place after the birth of Jesus. So when you really put it down, most of it's before Christmas. This is kind of the, the after Christmas picture and what we're supposed to do in response to Christmas. As the scene opens you find a group of shepherds who are out in the fields doing, you know, whatever it is that, that shepherds do, when suddenly they're interrupted by an angel who makes this incredible announcement. Luke chapter 2, verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people today. In the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. So at the end of verse 9, Luke says that the shepherds were terrified. And the word he uses doesn't just mean like they were startled. It doesn't mean that they just, you know, this is interesting. It means that they were literally paralyzed with fear and you understand why because if if you saw an angel you'd be terrified too or you'd be crazy but probably mostly mostly terrified uh, just as a side note back in march of this year the american psychological association released their annual harris poll in which they attempt to measure the average stress level of the average American. And it was interesting that in 2022, for the first time in the 20-year history of the survey, more than 80%, listen, it's more than 80% of Americans reported being significantly stressed, nearly to the point of being overwhelmed. One of the lead researchers summarized this year's survey by saying, Americans have been doing their best to persevere over these past two tumultuous years, but these data suggest that we're now reaching unprecedented levels of stress that will challenge our ability to cope. If you go back and dig into the survey, what you'll discover is that the things that, that most people are stressed out about are the same things that, that we're all stressed out about. The things that they're worried about are the same things that that you're worried about. Inflation, rising energy costs, grocery costs, supply chain issues, COVID-19, the possibility of cyber attacks, global uncertainty, deepening political divisions, the war in Ukraine, and that doesn't even count the things that are personal to you that, that you may be dealing with, relationship tension, health problems, all of that comes into play. And you add all of that together and then you realize that we're swimming in this ocean of negativity and breaking news alerts. And it's no wonder that so many people are on the edge. So many people are stressed out and maybe even a little bit terrified. I think that's the reason why the very first words out of the angel's mouth resonate so deeply. It's those four words do not be afraid. It's interesting, you read through the, the Christmas story, the different parts of the story, that's a four-word refrain that comes up again and again at significant moments 
in the story. For example, when Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, was told that his wife Elizabeth was going to give birth to this boy that would be the forerunner to the Messiah, the very first words out of the angel's mouth were, do not be afraid. When the angel appeared to Mary and told her that she was going to give birth to, to this son that would be God's son, that would be the Messiah for his people, one of the very first things the angel said to her was, do not be afraid. Same thing happened to Joseph. An angel comes to him, says, hey, I know you don't understand any of this. I know you got a lot of questions, but just to calm your fears, here's what's going to happen. And by the way, do not be afraid. And then you come to the shepherds and it's the same Announcement. So you put all the pieces together, all of these things that are happening around these characters, and it's like God is, is driving home the point that somehow we have a choice in this. That somehow there is a way that we can choose not to be afraid no matter what's happening around us, what's happening to us, or what might happen in the future. So the question is, how do you make that choice? How do you cultivate a life of joy that goes past just the 24, 48 hours of Christmas in a world that often feels like it's filled with doom and gloom? Three things you see in the examples of the shepherd. First, if, if you want to cultivate a life of joy, you first have to believe the gospel. You first have to believe. A few years ago, there was a popular ad in the New York Times that was taken out in the holiday edition of the paper, and it described Christmas this way. It said, the meaning of Christmas is that love will triumph, and that if we all work together, we can create a world of unity and peace. And if you think about it, that's kind of what Christmas has been reduced to for a lot of people in our culture. It's also seen as this time, hey, we're going to get together with our family, we're going to watch a few old movies, we're going to exchange gifts, we're going to eat together. We're going to share a few you know, precious days off of work and just try to have a good time. But, but just so you understand, the way the biblical writers describe the first Christmas, it has nothing to do, I mean nothing at all to do with building a world of unity and peace. And it has even less to do with getting together with your family and exchanging gifts and watching old movies and enjoying some time off work. All of those things are just a byproduct of what it's really about. If you look at verse 10, the angel tells us what it's really about. He says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. So in a very real sense, the angel's announcement of Jesus' birth was a proclamation of the gospel. He wanted the shepherds to know that this is not just another baby born in an unexpected place. Instead, this is the one you've been waiting for. This is the long-awaited Messiah, the Savior, the Lord. That's why the angel says that it's good news. But the thing that makes it even better news is what he says next when he says, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. See, the thing that makes good news good is when you're included in it. If you're not included, it's just news. But if you're included in it, all of a sudden it's, it's good news. And the fact that the angel announced this to a group of shepherds underscores the fact that this is really good news for, for everybody. No matter where you've come from, no matter what you've done, no matter where you're heading, it is all good news if you accept it. Back in those days, the shepherds were on the lowest rung of the social ladder. Because they lived their lives out in the fields with the flocks, there was nothing they could do to keep the, the Jewish laws about being clean and unclean, so they were forever ceremonially unclean, which means even if they wanted to go to the temple, nobody would ever let them in. They were never invited to any of the parties. Uh, their only friends were like other shepherds. Even their family members kept them at arm's length. And in most cases, they spent their entire lives feeling as if they could never measure up because they couldn't. And the hard truth is that you can't either. Neither can I. And yet the good news of Christmas is that Jesus' birth into our world 
opens the door for us to be adopted into God's family through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. And maybe even the better news is that it's for everybody. It's for every single person. Young people, old people, rich people, poor people, educated people, uneducated people, married people, single people, divorced people, black people, white people, happy people, mad people, sad people, angry people. And but most of all, it's for guilty people. And since all of us are guilty, that means it's for us. But you first have to believe it. Now, the second thing, if you want to cultivate a life of joy, you have to, you have to share the gospel. It's one thing to believe it. It's something else to, to share. And as you keep reading the story, eventually one angel is replaced by an entire army of angels who fill the sky. And they proclaim God's glory both in heaven and on earth. So again, you see one of these collisions between what's happening in heaven and what's happening on earth. And then you get to verse 15, and there's this, there's this interesting transition that takes place. All of a sudden, the sky that had been filled empties out. And all of a sudden, the music comes to a stop. And, and over the next few days, you're going to experience a, a very similar transition um, the decorations are going to start to come down. The gifts are going to start to be put away. The Christmas music is going to disappear from the radio, at least for a few months. And then the family events are going to slow down. You're going to go back to work. You're going to go back to school. And then, you know, worst of all, the credit card bill is going to come in January, and you're going to think, oh, my goodness, what happened? And that's, that's just how it works. There's always this transition. So what do you do when Christmas is over? How do you respond when it comes to an end? Look at what the shepherds did, verse 15. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. It's interesting. The very first thing the shepherds did after encountering Jesus was they went out to tell the story of Jesus. Keep in mind that as shepherds, these guys are just like us. These are not theologians. They're not Old Testament scholars. They don't have all the answers. They can't connect all the dots all they know is what they've heard and what they've experienced with Jesus, and they're willing to share that. I, th I was thinking back yesterday over uh, the last year in our church, and in many ways, it's been a, a great year. Through all the ups and downs of the previous two or three years, uh, it, it's really been a great year. We've been able to do some things that we never thought we'd be able to do, had a record number of, of baptisms, but... But even with all the great things that we've been able to do, I wonder what it would be like if just a few of us, not everybody, but, but just a few of us, got a little more serious about sharing the message of the gospel. Now, the tendency is when you hear something like that, you hear the preacher say, you say, that's right, preacher, that's what we should be doing. But before you agree with me, I want you to ask yourself two questions. Number one, ask yourself, when's the last time I invited somebody to come to church? And the second question is, when's the last time I intentionally had a spiritual conversation with somebody who I knew was far from God? Could you name that time? Now, you hear that, and some people object to that, and they say things like, you know, I, I would love to do that, but I really don't feel like I know enough to issue those kinds of invitations or to engage in those kinds of conversations, and I, I get that. I, I really do. It's just that some people, some people have been using that same excuse for 10, 15 maybe 20 years. And so the question becomes, is there ever going to be a moment where you feel like you know enough? The other thing to keep in mind is that for most of us, not knowing enough has never stopped us before. Just think about 
all the things that you talk about on a normal basis that you really don't know anything about, but you talk about them over and over. Let's just be honest. Some of us have convinced ourselves that we are experts in everything. doesn't matter what the topic is. It could be the government, the legal system, the healthcare industry, the banking industry, military strategy, education, who the coach of our favorite team should be playing, how the sinkhole should be repaired, what the mayor should be doing, what the United Nations, how they should be organized. I mean, it could be almost any topic. And we are quick to offer an opinion. But then when it comes to the one thing that's by far the most important thing and the one thing that we should know the most about, we get strangely silent. Just think about what the shepherds knew and what they didn't know. And what they knew was not much. But they were willing to share what they knew so that other people could have the same experience that they had. Now, there's one more thing. If you want to cultivate a life of joy in a world that's filled with doom and gloom, you have to worship continually. I want you to check out the way Luke puts this in verse, verse 20. It says, The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. I want you to focus on that word, returned. After a, a once-in-a-lifetime kind of experience, it was time to go back. It was time to return to their normal routine. So you think about it, from one angle, you could say that for these guys, nothing had really changed. I mean, they still had the same co-workers. They've still got the same jobs. They're going back to the same fields to watch over the same flocks. They're not going to be any richer. They're not going to be any more respected. They're not going to get invited to any more parties than they would have before. They're still going to be excluded from most people's circles. And the people that kept them at arm's length before are still going to keep them at arm's length. So you could say that from one angle, nothing was really different. But from a different angle, everything was different. That's why Luke tells us that when they returned, when they went back, they went back glorifying and praising God. And the way it's written in Greek, Luke uses what's called the present participle, which just means this wasn't a one-time event. This was an ongoing, continual thing. This wasn't something they just did at Christmas, and we're going to forget about this till next Christmas. And this wasn't something that they did you know, once a week on Sunday. This was an everyday kind of thing. In fact, they did it so much that it became a part, and it became the, the major part of who they were. And one of the things that can happen as the calendar transitions from December into January and the start of a new year is there is a tendency for all of us to fall back, to return to those familiar routines and slowly forget about what we've just celebrated here at the end of December. And you know how it happens. It's, it's very easy but subtle. Right now, everywhere you look, there are subtle reminders of the Christmas story. You walk into a store, and if you listen close, in the background, you will still hear Joy to the World or Handel's Messiah. You flip through channels on TV, and today especially, it'll be one Christmas special after another, uh, most of which will at least give some nod to the real story of Christmas. Then if you go to church, you hear the story. If you've got kids involved in the, in the performance, you know, you hear them practice their parts and you get to relive the story every day until the performance is over. But then, but then all of that comes to an abrupt end. And you go back to work and the kids go back to school and the sports kick back in and Christmas becomes a memory rather than an ongoing reality. And I think that was a temptation for the shepherds just like it is for us. I'm sure they go back and been out there a few nights and they're watching the same old sheep doing the same old thing. The excitement starts to wear off. And maybe even those old familiar feelings of doom and gloom begin to try and, and settle back in. But somehow, despite all the challenges of their daily lives, they, they were able to hang on to the joy of Christmas because they knew that something had happened that changed everything. I've got a picture I want to show you. Um, just so you know, uh, this is not Santa Claus. After a long night of delivering presents. That's not him. 
Instead, this is a guy named Malcolm Geit. You probably never heard of him. He's an interesting character. He is a, uh, he's a writer, an Anglican priest, a professor of theology at Oxford University in England, a songwriter, and also serves as the lead guitarist and lead singer in a rock band uh, called Mystery Train, which if you look at the picture, it's interesting that he, he looks exactly like what you would expect a theology professor and a rock you know, lead guitarist to look like. I mean, just look at this guy. So yeah, that makes, that makes perfect sense. I, I told my family, I'm thinking about changing my look in 23. This may be, this may be what I go for. Um, a few months ago, uh, Alan Harrelson, who's a member of our church, uh, has a history professor himself, uh, started talking to me about the, some of the poetry of Malcolm Guy. Now, I'll be honest, that's, that's never been my thing. Most of it goes uh, right over my head. But, but I did come across one poem from 2011 titled Christmas on the Edge that Malcolm Guy wrote that I think perfectly describes the collision between hope and fear that occurred when Jesus was born into the world. I want you to listen to these words. Here's what he wrote. Christmas sets the center on the edge. The edge of town, the outhouse of the inn, the fringe of empire far from privilege, and power on the edge and outer spin of turning worlds, a margin of small stars, that edge, a galaxy itself, light years from some unguessed at cosmic origin. Christmas sets the center at the edge. And from this day, our world is realigned. A tiny seed unfolding in the womb becomes the source from which we all unfold and flower into being. We are healed. The end begins, the tomb becomes a womb. For now in Him, all things are realigned. After the angels disappeared, the shepherds eventually returned to a world that looked a lot like the world they had previously left. And yet deep down inside, they knew that everything was different because through the birth of Jesus, the world itself has been realigned. And so on those days, when it feels like the, the doom and gloom is just overwhelming and there's a tsunami of of bad news that wants to pull you under, you have to continually remind yourself of the good news that brings great joy to all the people. I want you to stand uh, with me. As a part of our Christmas morning celebration, we're going to sing a couple more songs. And remember, earlier I said that one of the things that, that makes good news good is when it includes you. So if for some reason... You're here and you say, well, I'm not sure I'm included in any of this. Uh, we want you to know we can help you do that even today on Christmas Day. So if you need to pray with somebody, if you need to talk to somebody, if you have questions about what that would look like for you, David Phillips will be right here. I'll be right here and we'd be glad to talk with you. Would you sing with us?